we at 6.30, we have a quorum. We'll call a planning board meeting to order. And first up for general information, do we have anybody, Bill? Uh, uh, Jim Channing from Pride. Okay. Evening. Good evening. Good to see everyone. Uh, yeah. I've had some conversations with Mr. Dwyer and submitted an electronic copy of a request for an ANR or approval not required for the Russell Street addresses. If I could share my screen, it might be the easiest. If sure, let me just do that. Make that little adjustment. Okay, you're good. Thank you. I'll just go over the application very quickly, if you don't mind, so you know. So we're talking about you know zero Russell Street or 55 Russell Street. I think it's 13 through 25, the new uh, pride over in the, the west part of town. Again, there's three parcels currently, 04C, 23A, 04C24 and 04C25. Uh, the main intent of the ANR is to combine the lots from three lots to two lots. Uh, the proposed frontage for lot one, and I'll show you in a second, would be 369 feet. And the proposed frontage for lot two would be 274.89. Again, there's no change in the actual frontage. It is on Route 9 or Russell Street. Um, does comply in our surveyor again certified uh, the same does comply with ordinance section 4.2 which requires a minimum as you're familiar a minimum of 175 feet for any such building lot um, going down to the specifics of the lot again lot one or 23a is this lot here again this is the former getty the triangle Current existing, I'll describe as lot, I guess B, maybe I should say A. So this is lot A. This would be lot B, which is 24 or 4C24. And then lot C is again where the station is. And technically the property line currently between 24 and 23 is here. And again, the right of way uh, slightly to the west of that, where you can see the new right of way. So the main purpose or intent of this is just to combine and create two lots instead of the three lots. Again, almost divided uh, slightly by the, what would be the right of way. The right of way itself would be contained on lot two. And the proposed area of that is 132,032 square feet. And again, the proposed area for lot one would be 100,008 square feet, give or take. Uh, again, getting back to the frontage again, we're dealing with close to 300 uh, square or 300 feet, excuse me on what's known as 25 Russell Road. And the other one's approximately, I think, 195 uh, feet of frontage on for the first lot. Okay. It's really just trying uh, procedurally to clean some things up to get two separate lots instead of the three. And then uh, ultimately, hopefully, something will get developed on lot one. But it's I think this is the first step in, in the, the direction to see exactly what we can and can't do with lot one is to get just the actual defined uh, new lot created. Okay. Yeah, when I saw the first A and R plan, I says, I thought we had already divided this property, so I wasn't quite sure what you were trying to do. Now I see, so you're just combining from three to two. All right. Okay. Yeah, I think whether the doctrine of merger would have had, I'm just trying to clean it up, have a plan that's recorded on file that clearly identifies uh, the two lots. They're, in my opinion, clearly buildable and we're not, trying to change the frontage or anything aside from just uh, procedurally cleaning up a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Would that, would that require a drainage easement? It, it looks like you've got a drainage area along there, the west side of your, your uh, cut through. Correct. Yeah. There, there would be a proposed new drainage easement again, the area of this down in the, behind the gas stations around 29,000 square feet. The, the culvert goes down here into this area. And then that dra drainage easement area would be approximately 42,000 square feet as well. It's the rectangular area I'm seeing along the driveway, subsurface stormwater 
infiltration area. So that would be the drainage from parcel C is going on to parcel B? Correct, yeah, partially over. There is one over near the upper right-hand corner too, but it would be, again, the need for ultimately when lot one gets developed, um, evaluation of the stormwater system, whether or not there'd be a shared system or not, but at least there'd be the, the need for the overflow, given the fact that it's in the floodplain district, absolutely the need for the stormwater to be there at a minimum for right now, the gas station lot, and ultimately, depending on what may or may not occur in lot one, uh, either additional stormwater or at least a mutual use of the stormwater area. Okay. Do you have a form A, Jim? As part of your applicant, you're part of your thing here? I, I had these two forms are the only ones I had. I don't know if this is. Yeah, that's the form A from the new subdivision regulations. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. It's the most recent one I had. If there's a, a better one, certainly please let no, me know. No, that's fine. That'll do. I didn't see the form A at the top. I apologize. Okay. What I'll do, we'll, after we approve this, I will take and print out Form A, sign it, and uh, put the filing fee on it. Then you can file it with the town clerk, et cetera. And as far as getting the, form, the actual uh, plan signed, you can see at your convenience, Bill Dwyer, Joseph Rodnick, or myself. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so what's the filing fee going to be, Jim? Twenty-two fifty, minimum, because we're not creating any new frontiers. So it'll just be the minimum filing fee. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Channy, I don't know. I, you did send me the plan, but I. And I sent that around, but I don't know if you sent the ANR. So if you would just. Uh, yeah, I got the. I sent it earlier the, today. Only today I sent the ANR around, or the Form A, I should say, around. Excuse me. Oh, okay. Yeah. You raising your hand, Mike? No. You got your hand up. Your Zoom hand. Oh, that one. Okay, I'll make a motion to approve the uh, signing the Form A. Second. You have motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Very good. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. So next person I have on my list is identified only as Kathy. I think that's uh, ideal movers, Kathy. Okay. Is that correct, Kathy and, and Brett? They're muted. Um, and then I also have Mark Dean. Um, How's everyone part, tonight? You're part of the development team. Okay, so we'll... Um, okay. Um, maybe we can do, we still have a couple of minutes before the scheduled resumption of the public hearing. Um, I think the only, and I was expecting, uh, Randy Eisen to be here when, uh, for the Michelson accessory apartment, um, we're talking about it, scheduling it for the 19th, but the actual request that Kevin sent in was for the 17th, which is the Sunday. Um, wow. so I think we just have to, um, uh, I was going to have Randy, uh, ask Randy if he would just request a further extension. Okay. Um, but, uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, clearly that was a, um, it was a typo in the, in the request because we don't meet on Sundays. So, uh. Yeah. So I'll make a motion to uh, 
to uh, to continue to our next meeting, the uh, the nineteenth, um, and not to the seventeenth. Okay. Is that going to be a formal presentation? Yes. Uh, is this the accessory apartment or his yes. accessory apartment? Are we going to notify the uh, about they it? They are very aware of it. Yes. I mean, Michael okay. Pill is re is representing the abutters, and I I've been emailing Michael Pill every time they request an extension. Okay. Hey, good catch on that, Bill. I didn't notice that one. Okay. So I have a motion to go continue to this 19th. Was that, that a motion you made, Bill? I, that's the motion I made. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Yeah, that brings us right about up to ideal mover time. I don't I see, any, I don't have anyone else for uh, drop in business. Okay. We will reopen, reopen, not reopen, continue the hearing for ideal movers um, and turn it over to Mr. Sparkle. Yes. Good evening. Good to see <clears throat> everyone again. Um, I'm gonna do the screen share here uh, with my phone ringing, turn that off. Here we go, all right. So uh, picking up basically where we left off, uh, there have been a few minor changes and some new information that's been swirling around even as early as uh, this evening, this afternoon. Uh, just briefly, same project team. I'll say we're a bit of a skeleton crew tonight. Um, it's mostly going to be me and uh, Tom Reedy's double booked. Uh, there are other events happening. And um, we also have Mark Dean here, who you saw earlier. Uh, so if there are questions regarding building, lighting, et cetera, his brain trust will, will get into that. Um, I won't read through these, but these are the sort of the homework that we had and the things that I think need to be addressed to wrap up the public meeting discussion. And we'll get started with the site plan. Just a few changes. The most significant is the water main. So I was able to sit down and have a meeting with Chris Okafor, at the DPW, uh, along with a couple of his tenants down there, and we brainstormed uh, what would work best for the town as well as serve the needs of this facility. And there is this light blue, an existing 10 inch AC water main up here. This is north of the rail trail behind the Walmart Plaza. What the DPW requested is that a full municipal 10 inch water main be brought down. Uh, and terminated. It would be a dead end line. There would be a hydrant installed, uh, a fire service, and probably a separate potable water service. We might be able to piggyback these lines together depending on fire flow requirements, but one or two pipes will be going into the building from the street. Uh, other changes, um, the last tidbit left over from uh, Berkshire Design Group's comments was <clears throat> that we still had an elevation difference between the threshold of the building at the main entrance here and the, the parking lot elevation. And instead of making up that elevation difference internal to the building, what I was asked to do was raise the parking up a bit. So this area is up about a foot. There are no changes to the geometry whatsoever, just a little grading change. I also added notes for the Knox box, both on the building and on the gate. So that's it as far as the site plan changes. Uh, there was um, hopes that we would have a sign that was sort of proportionate to the, the very tall, wide building and uh, understanding that that would require a, a variance that would be significant uh, to accomplish what we're proposing then is 
a building sign that's 63.8 square feet. So not much wiggle room, but uh, we've, we're under the 64 square feet. Exact same uh, type of sign, aluminum letters, LED backlit. The architect did provide an updated rendering. Uh, so you'll see there's no sign on the south side, which there used to be. And the sign on the front is reduced uh, per the dimensions previously established. There were questions about the lighting, particularly, um, so as you can see in the rendering that these display windows uh, that show uh, interior doors there uh, are have lights on the walls. And there was discussion about, well, how, how bright is that gonna be? What, what is that gonna be like? So the architect was able to provide um, a cut sheet as well as a little information in a letter which was submitted last week about these uh, little wall wash lights, they're, they're four inch lights. Um, they will be on a dimmer. So they have the ability to go from a thousand lumens down to a hundred lumens per light. And that's equivalent to eight candles, a hundred lumens is actually a little less than eight candles. So it, these are not very bright when they're on in the evenings. Um, so they, they should impose any type of significant light pollution issue. Uh, the lights also do face the walls, they're wall washed, so they don't point out into the public way uh, from there. Uh, uh, next item that was requested was to increase the, um, the native species in the landscaping. Uh, originally, there were very few. Um, I, I learned that apparently native species are a lot more hassle <laughs> to maintain. Uh, so I, I learned a bit from the landscape architects today. However, uh, now the site plan does include more than half of the species are native. Um, and it's essentially the same plan uh, with just uh, slightly different plants in different locations. There's 16 species um, plus annuals. Uh, they aren't even listed because they're just brief. Um, overall, there are 162 perennial plantings on site. And uh, the one addition is that the retaining wall um, has been added schematically to the plan and it's gonna have blue gamma, blue gramma. I thought it was gamma, but it says blue gramma grass. So to, to soften that, that wall that faces the, the rail trail. So it's not a strong public view, but uh, we are gonna try and soften that. That's the only changes to the landscape plan. Going down a little bit farther. Um, so this wasn't, this hasn't been on the table before. And it's something that we realized is a gray area. Tom Reedy, who unfortunately can't be here tonight, suggested that we, we you know, put this straight on the table. It was in my letter before. And the port cochere, so for a moment, I'm gonna jump back to the architectural rendering. This overhang canopy so that clients have the ability to get out of the weather, the rain, the sun when they're loading and unloading. It's open on three sides, does come into the side setback. So this dashed line is the side setback. Now, I know Berkshire Design Group didn't flag this. This has been uh, in front of the board for a little bit now and nobody has mentioned it. It's not even clear to us if the side setback applies to an open-sided accessory function like this. So kind of tonight, my, my question is, do we have to worry about setback on this particular structure? Because we would rather know now uh, so we can take the appropriate action. Um, and I'd be happy to move on, but if the, the board would consider discussing that even now, I, I would love that feedback. Now, is there any significance to using a French phrase rather than not calling it an entrance way? <laughs> um, I, I have taken this from the, the architect and I, I come to appreciate architectural language. It's very specific and a lot of it is not from English, um, you know, finials and, and other things that are not, are not native to our tongue. So my understanding is Port Cochere translates to uh, coach entrance, coach, um, coach doorway. So that's just the name of it, I guess. Okay, I, I just was curious. That's I had all. to look it up. I, this was my first encounter. I just did so. Sure. Yeah. I would I would interpret it as an extension of the building, and so it would require a ZBA variance. But I'm not the expert. What's the size setback in the industrial zone? Forty feet. It is. Hmm. Okay. 
So as you get, to, I have the 40 foot setback annotated. And right now we are 24.7 to the face of the overhang, a little farther to the pillars. Um, and Bro, yes, please. Re recall that the senior center came before us and wanted a port cochere in front of their building. And we denied it. Of course, that was after site plan review. Mm -hmm. Well, Well, they're being upfront about it, and uh, it yeah. probably would fall into the category of a variance. And I don't, I don't know. You have an interpretation? I would imagine the ZBA would be favorable. I don't think it has any deleterious impacts on, on the adjacent property. I agree. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't... It's just because they're in the, in the industrial zone that's a 40-foot setback, that's, that's all there is. I mean, in all the other zones, is 15 feet. I think it's actually an enhancement to the property. There's no way we can approve it here? No. No, I think I, I, think I agree. It is part of the structure. It's part, an integral part of the design, and <clears throat> for, for good reason. Um, but... Um, yeah, I think it's going to need. I think it's going to need a variance. And understood. This was, you know, the. You know, I don't want to say the worst case scenario. We figured that it would likely be subjected to the setback, and we we wanted to find that out ahead of time. So uh, separate, obviously, because it's a ZBA process, we will be seeking a variance. Um, we're hopeful that we will be able to receive that for some reasons that have already come up in the discussion this evening. So uh, we won't be modifying our site plan uh, at this juncture. Um, and if for some reason the variance is not successful, you would probably see us back for a public hearing or public meeting perhaps um, with whatever revision we have to do architecturally to, to satisfy the ZBA. Um, yeah. So, yes. Is, is you're, so you're just going to seek a variance for the 40 foot side yard set back to 15.6 feet. Is that correct? Well, the 24.7 feet. Oh, 24.7 feet. Yeah, the pavement width is is 15. Oh, okay, okay. Feet. I didn't see that. All right, okay. Yeah, so right. we're we're almost 25 feet from the lot line, which is wider yeah. than most setbacks for the side yard and other zonings. I mean, seeing that the planning board has no issue with this. If you keep the planning board informed when you have the ZBA hearing, I will come and speak in favor of the variance. Thank you very much. I would bet the cows would probably speak <laughs> its favor. <laughs> we, can, we can get a couple of moves over there out of snow. Yeah. Well, I'd be hard pressed to see them as opposed in the public hearings. <laughs> Although I, I would be very oh. interested to see that. Well, it's a Zoom hearing, so it'd be easy not to put one out. <laughs> um, Anyways. All right. Um, well, th thank you for the feedback, and we will plan accordingly. Just a question on the, on the plant yes, thing. You said that native species are more um, work to maintain than uh, non-native species. That's interesting. That, that was what Snow and Sons said. Um, they, they originally designed the site for, you know, attractiveness and low maintenance and apparently you know they, they have no problem putting in the native species but the feedback was well sure we can do that but it, it will cost you more to maintain because there's just going to be more care required and more effort and i i don't have further information than that, I, no, that I was, that's fine. i'm not looking for detail i just uh i mean i i, I believe have to believe them they're, they're they're those guys are the people that know what they're doing not us yeah that's, that's how i felt about it too um but I would imagine if you just wanted to take native, it wouldn't be a problem. But when you say native and you want it to be attractive, that might narrow down and then you get into more, more maintenance. Possibly. Um, well, if I get a chance to talk to the landscaper directly about that detail, I would, I would love to learn. I'm populating my own you know, new construction home that I'm surrounded by now with native species and hearing that they're more maintenance made me, you know, Break my ears up a little bit. 
Um, and speaking of pricking up ears, uh, I'm going to move on to the farmland preservation bylaw. Um, we did receive this afternoon, and hopefully the, the board's had an opportunity to review, I, I believe Mr. Dwyer has, um, we did receive from the attorney, uh, Jeff Blake, that uh, the, a, a reasonably long opinion that, that comes down to the idea that the planning board has the ability to reasonably and rationally interpret note three of the table of uses. And note three is the note that said in the business and industrial zoning, square footage over 75,000 square feet gross floor area um, would be subject to um, the, the transfer development rights. So um, I guess the first step before I go further is what is the board's interpretation of note three of that table? I, I believe that that is what we thought should be the case, that we were putting in a large building in the industrial zone, and that's why note three is there to, um, to balance the impact of large structures on the farming inventory of the town. My concern when I first asked the question was whether the wording would, would preclude putting a building of that size in that location. So that, that has been uh, addressed and it, it does not. So it is going to be subject to the um, farmland preservation bylaw. Now, as to your questions, um, as, as you know, the um, Conservation Commission has been restructured uh, and staff has departed. Uh, I know the last time we talked about this, Jim has a figure from the Conservation Commission, but it's three or four years old for what the, um, the average value is. I did, uh, as soon as I received the email from Jeff Blake, uh, send an email to Ron Hall, who is the regional responsible party for the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, asking him if he had that information or any kind of raw information that would allow me to generate a rate. I have not had a reply from him today. So, um, so I, don't, uh, I don't have the answer, but Jim, do you have the, the old figure handy? Ah, uh, no, I don't. It's somewhere around just under 10,000. Yeah, I think it was 9,500. Uh, that sounds acre. reasonable. Yeah. 9,500 per acre? Correct. Yeah. And that applies to the area over 75,000 square feet? Yeah, so you'd need, you'd need 10 and a half acres of uh, TDR land, which come out to be about a, right around $100,000. I'm sorry, where does the 10 and a half acres come from? For each 2,000 square feet of building, you need one acre of TDR land. So you are 21,000 square, 21,500 square feet over 75. So you'd need ballpark 10 and a half acres right. of TDR land. And this applies only to the large building or for all square footage on site? Anything over 75,000. For the project or for just one building? For the one building. So you got a, small, you got a small accessory building? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the small building doesn't count. Okay. The small building, that's correct. It's a sing, the single building. Okay, my numbers included the 4,000 square feet of that back storage unit in here. So we are, we're about 96,000 okay. square feet. Yeah, so 90, so, 92,000, so you're eight and a half acres. Well, now, now we know uh, ballpark um, what, what we're looking at in this particular case. Um, all right, well, thank you for that information. And is there something we can do to, to get uh, a definitive answer on that rate? Um, or is that just entirely on the town's end at this point? Well, if Mr. Dwyer has got an answer back, let's say within a week or so, or how, well, how fast do you want to move to the, because we need another public hearing to do this. And you also need a zoning variance. 
So between the two of them, you're looking probably another month out. I mean, the zoning variance for the, the setback, but it's just a special permit for the TDR, correct? Correct. Just that's making correct. sure I have the, the process lined up here. And right. that special permit is through the planning board for the right. TDR. And, and the variance is to the ZBA. So you know, if, and we have, yeah. So depending how fast you want to, let's, let's say Mr. Dwyer doesn't hear back within a week from the person that he requested the information, we'll just go with the old value we have. Well, I think we could probably go ahead and schedule a public hearing. On that's true. We can schedule, that's true. We don't need the value to schedule a public hearing. You're absolutely right. Okay. Um, is that, I'd love to schedule. I'm not sure if that is possible at, at this point. Can, can we do that? Yes, we can. Um, well, today, let me see. Today is the 21st. Let me see what we have on our agenda here for a month from today. Oh, you don't want to be on the 1019 meeting. That could be a very contentious hearing. Um, if it actually happens. I think you want to avoid that one. No. We could schedule you. Is November 2nd an election day this year, Mr. Dwyer? Uh, I don't believe so. Not in... Uh... Not in Hadley or, well, I don't think it's a state election. That's usually every two years, right? We had one last year. Yeah. We're not having a state election. We're not having a town election. Okay. We could schedule you for November 2nd. All right. Please book us for that. We'll do what it takes I, to get the application in. Yeah, I will email you an application with the information. And then I'll take care of the, the uh, notices. And the list of abutters, I'm assuming, would be the same as we had for, yeah, because the, the, body, the abutters list would be the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so if you could get us <sighs> two more sets of abutters list or, or envelopes, however you want to do it. Okay. Right, I believe uh, Attorney Reedy's office took care of that last time, so I was saved that small bit of tedium. Okay. But hopefully they still have that file and they can hit print just as easily. All right, so we have a plan and a path forward on the TDR topic. Um, and it, was there anything else on that that I am missing before I move on? No, I mean... Uh... I mean, I think you covered pretty much everything we had concerns about. Okay. Well, Jim, before, before he leaves us, I, I have a question about the water, the timetable. and Okay, yeah. Sure. Could, I, I do have one more slide, um, okay. if I may. Go ahead. Sure. Um, Finish your slide. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and, and this is preemptively, um, basically because of COVID and construction and material unpredictability, um, as well as the, a preloading requirement for the soils. The special permit for the site plan review normally would expire after a year. This is quite likely to not be enough time and we would request a two year uh, expiration date on this permit. Okay, that's easy to explain. That one year um, thing, that, that one year lapsing has been extended to two years and I believe right now we're, with the COVID, we are sitting at three years. Oh, okay. I know for the emergency order up until June 14th or 15th, there was um, permits were all extended. Was there another emergency order and I missed that? No, no I, I believe, maybe, let me back up. We used to be two years for, from compl substantial completion and I think we changed it within our zone bylaw and adopted a state chain. And we're now at three years. Is that correct, though? Uh, yeah, that was my recollection. Um, or that it, we, it went up to two years. And then, uh, then it was something was extended to three years. Right. Um, I'm just trying to take a quick look. Um, but he can always ask for an extension if it's right. falls within a deadline. 
Right. Sure. It's easier to ask now, particularly that, you know, because there's so many clays under the primary building, they have to bring a lot of soil and preload that clay to basically squish the water out of it. Um, it's not quite sure how long that's going to take. It could take upwards of a half year right there where nothing could happen. So if we could just get that something official, if it's already in the rules or, you know, at, written into the decision um, for at least two years, if it's three, great. Yeah, I'm just not seeing it uh, on a quick glance here. Is the question, is it two years or is it three years, Mr. Dwyer? Uh, that was the, th the three years. I'm just, uh, they have a couple of things scattered around here. So let me just check one other. Sure. The timetable, uh, does it mean the starting of the construction? Does it mean substantial uh, improvement to the, uh, to the soil, to the ground? In, in regards... I remember, I remember when they used to require a certificate of needs for medical building or hospital additions, et cetera, et cetera. And... Uh, that just required the beginning of the construction and it could mean a bulldozer just going over the land and taking some of the, the soil off the top. But that... Yeah, right. At least the, yes, there, sir. there are some cases that interpret it as something, something more than... Um, something less than completion, but something more than not having broken ground. There's, uh, um, but I think we could definitely put it down for two years and um, go ahead from there. If, that, uh, that sounds good. Yeah, if, if we have at least two years on the clock, then we're comfortable. And if there's a year after that, all the more comfortable, of course, like most people, um, you know, they'd, they'd love to get this up and running as soon as possible, um, but it's, it's not, you know, you can write checks a lot faster than you can build buildings. Um, and was there was another another question about an earlier part of yeah, the presentation? It kind of dovetails into exactly what we're discussing now. Mm -hmm. uh, when the water hookup, uh, mm -hmm. Where is the water supply coming from? Are you going to have to go all the way down South Maple Street in conjunction with the Route 9 improvement, or is it going to be hooked up uh, halfway down South Maple Street? And what, it, what does the town have for a timetable on that? Because all right. It requires so town cooperation. We are trying to stay ahead of the mass DOT improvements that are from the rail trail north, because yeah. we would have to come through a portion of that and it would be terrible timing to have a brand new road and then cut a trench. Right. So um, there, there's, and, I, and I'm not quite sure the, the mass highway timetable as well. Uh, I wasn't under the impression that that would be definitely not this year. And I wasn't under the impression that it would happen next year, or maybe it would. Um, I think it would be beneficial to the town and, and Mass Highway as well as to, to make that extension um, to get passed before that date, at the very least, you know, to get out of the, the way of the construction. If for some reason they want to stop um, for cost reasons or, you know, bank loans haven't been released and every stick of pipe is is problematic early in the process um you know they may not extend the full thing right away uh, but I mean, the, the work itself is a, a couple of days of work really i mean easily within a week if you throw a couple of rain days in there okay so where will we where will you start uh is so it the 
with the wall and see if I can get them. Well, the rail trail is here and north of the rail trail, the 10 inch water main comes and then makes a bend, parallels the rail trail behind the, the Walmart, Walmart Plaza. Can you so, expand or zoom your oh, uh, PDF oh. just to focus on that area? Yeah, of course. I'm sorry. There I am pointing. Oh, look, lots of pixels. Beautiful. Um, but yeah, right now, the, the DPW doesn't know exactly where that pipe is. So there's a hydrant nearby. We're going to have to scope this out. You can't locate it with a metal detector because it's an AC pipe. Um, and that's, uh, that's a small technical point. We will be able to find the pipe. Uh, we'll open up, we'll cut out the corner here, we'll put in a T, uh, probably with a bend, depending on the exact angle that's really here, add three valves, which would be to the benefit of the town, uh, and then carry the new water main, the, the darker blue line to the south. So the responsibility of extending the water main, is that going to be the town's responsibility or is it going to be your responsibility? Well, this isn't clear at this point. Um, and I would love clarity uh, on this topic um, at today's meeting. I, I'm not sure I'm not sure how to do this bit of know, horse trading, so to speak. Obviously, this facility does require a water service. There's reasonable expectation that you build a new building. you you go and you dig a trench down to the water main. In this case, the water main's kind of far away. Um, farther than we would prefer. At the same time, what we're being asked to build is far more significant in scale than is actually necessary for this building. So it would be my hope that at a minimum, there would be a degree of cost sharing on this. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's fair that any individual property owner buy a bunch of municipal water main um, that belongs to the town is maintained by the town. That you're, talk, you're talking right into my next question, and it seems like a reasonable, you, you're hitting the nail right on the head, so I'm, yeah. that, that, that's a discussion that for will the, be discussed later, yeah. That's a discussion for the Board of Selectmen as Water Commissioners. Okay, that's where that is going to come from. Yep. Now, getting back to your question on special permits. Thank you. Back in 2018, Section 6, Point one, I forgot what exact number, was amended such that all special permits expire three years after the date of issuance. Three years. Okay. So three years. Now, the, right. the section 8.9.2 may not have been changed, so it's a little bit of a confusion there. But the main section of the bylaw that deals with special permits and variances specifically says all special permits shall expire three years after the date of issuance. All unless right. unless extensions have been requested. Thank you for that clarity. Three years should be plenty of time. So does the board want to take a position on the ability of the contractor to utilize the TDR funds to incorporate that into the extension of the water main? We don't have that authority. Is that something the Board of Selectmen would be able to discuss and act upon? The, the Board of Selectmen don't have that authority to use TDR funds for that. Okay. Ooh, uh, who does? Nobody. Town meeting. Ah. Oh. All right. TDR funds shall be used for agricultural preservation. I believe. Well, certainly that was the original intent. However, uh, the CPA now has been funding uh, much of the town share of agricultural preservation restriction. So there's never a short, short supply on the financial side to qualify for the town share. So this, 
there may be a possibility of using it to alleviate the town from the burden of, or the contractor from the burden of extending that water main. And that's another question too. I remember if there were a subdivision coming down here and the water was that far, it would be the town's responsibility and correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, and this happened, I think, in a couple of towns, and Southampton was one, where it was the town's obligation to extend the water line to the subdivision. So uh, this is a little bit beyond our pay grade, maybe, to make that decision, but I'm just throwing the thought out there. Reasonable thoughts. Sounds like we've got a little more homework to do on um, some of the details around this. Um, but most of that also seems to be, if I'm understanding this correctly, outside of the planning board's purview and realm. Um, although you've got great information I keep learning here. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, That's a problem when you have some members that have been on this same committee forever. <laughs> they have long memories. <laughs> There's so much value to deep experience in these situations, much better than a green board. Oh boy. Um, so <laughs> that's sometimes a two edged sword, too. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. Um, I am, I'm not sure that I have more to discuss about the project at this point. Um, we, are, we are hopeful that. Um, the board would be willing to, to, you know, move forward on taking a vote on hopefully approving the site plan. Um, of course, subject to any uh, future permits and variances that, that need to be worked out. Uh, we, we've got a little bit of that to do with the ZBA um, and the TDR issue has to be fully resolved, but that um, that's a, a separate meeting. Um, but relative to the site plan, I'm, I'm going to wrap up here, and if you have other questions, of course, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. Are you going to come back in three or four years and request putting in a solar array on this property someplace? Um, well, the, the site's pretty well occupied. I don't see any more room for that unless it would be on the roof, and okay. I, have no, I have no knowledge about plans like that, I will say. Okay. Well, if you put it on the roof, you wouldn't need anything for the planning board. Um, when you, I have a question on the West parking lot, when you raised the grades 12 inches, did that have any impact on the runoff and what, what will hit South Maple? No, none whatsoever. Okay. Um, it's, it's a total fair question. Um, the, uh, there was no change in impervious area. There was no change in the geometry of the pavement or walks. And that's what drives the stormwater runoff calculations. Okay. I didn't know if the pitch gave it more speed so it would run past the, the uh, catch basins or not. Okay. Um, no, I, we're, we're at about three and a half percent grade. So it's, it's really pretty level. It is a parking lot. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you, Bucky, you are very well spoken. And oh. I learn a lot listening to you. So thank you. Well, thank yeah, you. Man. It's, it's, there's no question about it. As far as looking for a provisional uh, affirmative vote from the planning board, usually we're reluctant to do that because we'd like to see the variance passed. And, but you can get the sentiment of the board. Your presentation was forthright. It was honest. And uh, uh, we have confidence that you're going to do all the things you said that were available. But uh, uh, the variance certainly probably will pass and I, it would not bother you too much if we extended it to a, for a few weeks. Uh, I don't know. How's the rest of the board feel? Usually we don't, we don't give those provisional type of approvals on a site plan and a major construction like this. Yeah. I mean, I'd have, I'm ready to vote yes for. I mean, you're you're you 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 everything lined up here. But I think all the rest of the members are too. But you've got a couple of things that we got to be that you need. You need the uh, TDR and the zoning variance. And I think 
I don't see any reason why you're not going to get both of them, to be honest with you. That's so well. And because we got the TDR 11 2, we could continue this hearing to 11 2 and give you both approvals at the same time. Provided, um, the, ZBA, provided the ZBA has the variance by then. And it's not going to delay anything. Uh, not is, that I'm aware. Um, I do know that they're, you know, the, the owner of the land is still Gordon Smith. Um, uh, I don't have the details of the purchase and sale agreement, but I know there were some deadlines in there. And I, and I certainly know that the applicant, um, we, we already requested an extension some, some months ago, um, long, long before he ever met us, really. Um, so uh, it, it's, I guess in anticipation of trying to avoid a potential problem, um, I do know that this approval from the board was one of the contingencies in that purchase and sale, though I can't speak to the deadline per se. Pushing it off to November makes me a little bit nervous. If, if the board were willing to, to vote tonight, and I understand it is a provisional uh, getting the variance in the TDR, um, which would certainly be at, at our risk, if, if that weren't able to go forward, then this is all dead in the water. Uh, or we'd have to come back to revise the, the site plan. It would be appreciated if we could vote tonight. You're on mute, Bill. It, it is more work for us to, to issue two decisions. The transfer Fair. and development rights decision is format. I have a format that has that built into the site plan approval. And I think if we get through that, um, then I would be more comfortable saying uh, contingent upon obtaining a variance. I'm also concerned about where you stand with the Conservation Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, that application is completely done except I need the town's permission, which I've been trying to get from Chris, because with the work in the right-of-way, the town is one of the owners and the owners have to be on board with the permit application. I, maybe the board, uh, this board could you know, acknowledge uh, that yes, you would support the application. I was under the impression that that needed to come from the DPW. Um, maybe, maybe you can help me out here. As the I, application I to the conservation commission yes i need i need a signature from the town as the owner of the right-of-way so that's for, that's for the work proposed work with the water main yes okay where do you stand otherwise with the conservation commission um i did not submit the application it is sitting on my hard drive but it is complete I mean, have they done a wetlands delineation here? Or oh yes, <laughs> um, yes. There, there has been uh, quite a bit of discussion about the wetlands, and I'll just scan over here. Um, you can see the the designations A10. The uh, owner Gordon Smith did an abbreviated no notice of resource area delineation. Um, I believe was what he did. <clears throat> anyway, the the resource area has been reviewed by the. Uh, Conservation Commission, we would not have attempted the design without a very solid understanding of where okay. that line was because of the magic 35 foot buffer. The entire science project was designed off of this, uh, the magic no disturb line right here. So uh, we're, we're confident that the wetlands are well understood on this property and that we have uh, met all of the local and state regulations regarding but, but we're just staying out of it, really. That's that's how we're managing the situation, as well as putting up pretty solid erosion controls. But okay. we don't need any variances or waivers. It should be a straight by the book kind of application process. Okay, so I'm, I'm just concerned because the, the the functioning of the conservation commission is somewhat hampered right now. Where I you you brought that to my attention, and uh, it has me. Concerned in terms of the the timeline that that may unfold, um, but at the same time, there um, these things can definitely run in, in parallel. Uh, the, the 
process with the CONCOM usually isn't particularly long in, in regard matters like this in my experience, uh, since it's, it's pretty cut and dry, uh, one meeting, maybe two. Uh, and of course, there are a bunch of other things that have to happen in the background on our end. I, I would have liked to have made that application already, and I was ready to do that about two weeks ago, but I've just been chasing a signature from the DPW. Okay. Well, why don't you find out what the deadlines are on these purchase and sale agreements and you can come back on our next meeting. We can always um, talk about this again at that time. Are, are you saying that before the November 11th meeting that we could come back? If, if, we, if I find out, for example, that the deadline is, I'm going to pick, pick an arbitrary date, mid-October the 15th. Um, is that the terrible meeting day that you have? <laughs> was it the 19th? The 19th was the meeting that you said, try not to show up. But, if, right. but, if, but, but if you come in for the general information, you can either come in at a meeting. We have another meeting in two weeks from tonight and four weeks from tonight. So let's say you find out the uh, purchase and sale is, like you said, 10 15. You could commit at our next meeting and we could talk about this again if we had to. On 10 5. Yeah. All right. That that feels like a, a bit of a backup plan. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have, you know, I'm not privy to that, that part of the deal and operation here. There are a lot of moving parts and I'm just one member of a team. So I, I can't answer that directly, but that would be great. Um, if I find out that there's a real uh-oh on the calendar um, that the board is, you know, willing to help that process along so this whole thing doesn't just evaporate after we've done this to date. Okay, so I'll make a motion to continue to uh, October 5th to review deadlines. Okay. I would second that. Motion a second. Any other discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Right. Okay. So continued until October 10th. Thank you oh, very fifth. much. Uh, October sorry, 5th. 5th. I wrote down the 5th. I'm <laughs> the 5th. I'll be there on the 5th. Um, all right. Thank you. And thank you to Mark Dean for sitting through this. Yeah, yeah. I'm just here, I'm just here for the Bucky show. So <laughs> he put on a good one. That's right. Where, you, where are we talking to you at, Bucky? Where are you? I'm in Leeds. Oh, okay. You, where you were where? Northampton Leeds. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh god, so you're very local. I thought yeah. you were in England. Okay. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh four in the morning right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right gentlemen. thank you thank you so much thank you thanks for showing thank up mark you. okay uh mr ken hi board good evening good evening how are you very well how are you good i have to change you know i was prior to this i had a another meeting and so it was like now i have to you know change something in my head to to be talking about affordable housing um <laughs> so i think you know what i shared with the board on thursday was um the draft that we had gone through uh, at the august meeting um in addition to some resources that I found that could help the board quantify and imagine the number to be, and I'll, I'm just gonna share my screen because that's. Yeah, I like the Shrewsbury model. Yeah, so. Um, that's not brand new either. That's been in effect for a few years, hasn't it? Yeah, for a couple of years. Um, where is that? So the Shrewsbury model, and the thing is, do you, the question is whether or not, um, you know, in when it comes time to go through these processes of determining um, payments in lieu of, is the expectation that the applicant will already kind of have an understanding of what they're going to be paying, and then 
suggesting to the board that this is what I'm going to be paying based on your form, based on your regulation, or is the board, is it going to be the board's job to determine that that amount? Um, because I think, you know, it can happen either way. Um, there might be a ballpark that the board may fit, seem that the board may um, have already estimated, but the applicant will come in with their calculations based on the research that they've collected, based on your regulation. Um, so, you know, that was kind of, we left off at the August meeting with the, the request to, to provide some of the resources to determine that 2A, which is well, this. Ken, essentially there's gonna be a formula and we just have to plug the numbers in, correct? Um, yes, uh, it's going to be, um, where is that? Do I spell it out in this document? You know, A plus B parentheses minus C times this. Uh, so as long as you can give us a formula, uh, all we have to do is access the appropriate numbers, which are the mean income for uh, Springfield and whatever the other one is. I can't remember. Right. There was the MSA. There's the number of bedrooms. Yeah. But as long as we got a formula, we can click it in. I, I was just looking. When we started doing this originally, we weren't using a three bedroom house, you know, would that include a two car garage for affordable housing or to be a three car garage? That's a joke. Uh, I would think that we, we, we originally started out with a two, two bedroom, one bath. I think at the last, um, and you know, the board can um, interrupt me and clarify, but at the last meeting, there was a discussion because one of the examples that I shared had that amount of bedrooms. And I think this yeah. is specific. To... I read it. Okay. Yeah, I read it. I mean, I watched it. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, is it going to be, a th we're talking about affordable housing here. We're not talking about you know, for a family of six or seven, are we? I don't know. So just to clarify, are we are we in the PVPC conversation with Ken or have we reopened the public hearing on adoption <laughs> of regulations? I don't know. <laughs> how, do you, how do you tell the difference? Uh, <laughs> by, by opening up the hearing? Uh, yeah, let's let's just say that this is a uh, further discussion with Ken, and we'll we'll yeah. touch on the hearing later because I think we'll end up continuing it again. I yeah. don't think we're going to have a breakthrough tonight necessarily. No, I, I I agree with that. Well, you get my you get the gist of my question. I just uh, but I'll, I'll go along. With, you know, we've kind of spent a lot of time on this already, and uh, we want to get something down on paper. But we all want to also have something that's reasonable. Uh, well, I don't. See we're that. going to have a three, we're going to have a three bedroom house for affordable housing. Is it going to be a two car garage or three car garage? Does it matter that we say how many beds? I mean, there's aren't there charts for either? And isn't that up to the developer? I don't know. Well, if it's if it's if it's three bedroom, certainly it's going to cost more. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, the way it's worded is the average price of a residential unit, excluding four bedrooms. So if we take the average price of one through three bedrooms, that's going to raise that price significantly. Um, I thought I saw a chart that had two bedroom or three bedroom. No, maybe I imagined that. Well, you, you did, but it's, that's not in part of this calculation right here. Okay. So the, the thing that that makes it, and Mike, you you raise a good point because when uh, we were exploring this earlier, I know that uh, I went to one program that PVPC had, was sponsoring, and that was pre pre Ken days, um, and they had someone from whatever the relevant alphabet agency was in Boston, and. For their purposes, 
they count affordable units. They don't count bedrooms. So right. a, uh, a studio apartment and a four bedroom, if you will, counts the same house. They're each one unit. And I don't think, I don't and, that, think and that's fine for counting. We're we're talking about affordable to calculating the affordability. So if you take the average price of say two studio apartments and two three bedroom houses, and you try to calculate the affordability based on that, the three bedroom houses are going to greatly inflate the overall value. Mm -hmm. Not not you know I, I absolutely agree that they talk about units period whether it be right. one or six bedroom house it doesn't matter and that's great for for counting units but we're trying to calculate affordability of the home here and that's going to be a little bit of a different calculation based on size well do you all remember when uh, barry roberts had this focus group <laughs> of uh, people 55 and older housing when he was proposing the East Street Common. And he brought this focus group in, I don't know, 10 or 12 people. And what do you want to pay? We want to pay 225, 250. And there was a two bedroom, but uh, in a one car garage with no basement. But then he said, the people kept saying, well, we really would like one bedroom was large, the other was almost like a study. Well, well we want two large bedrooms. Uh, we would like a cellar. We would like two car garage. So it did escalate the cost. So if you did want to control the cost a little bit, you would say a one car garage, no basement, smaller bedrooms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, no granite countertops. Uh, there's some way that the developer could control the cost. But how do we put that input in? That's that. That's what I'm kind of wondering about. How do we, how do we put a figure to the reasonable price of a house for the affordability, as opposed to, I mean, we've seen there's there's some pretty expensive two or three bedroom houses in Hadley. There's a lot of very expensive three bedroom houses in Hadley. Yeah, and I think Bill Bill's point is correct. You know, it, we may not ask them to build a house as much as we would like to see what one looks like in an affordable unit. Uh, but if it's just a unit, maybe it could be off site somewhere. It doesn't have to be, and maybe that would be more in tune with being affordable. I'm not sure either. Yeah, I mean, th this 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 issue is getting your your favorite words, Joe. The devil's in the details. We're we're deep Absolutely. in the details right now, and it's getting it's there. Yeah, I mean, we want to we want to make it so that the developer can put some money into a fund but we also want it to be a reasonable amount of money and not some ridiculous thing that we get nowhere with. Well, if it's my fear is if it's too reasonable, then there's no incentive to build the affordable housing. And then we're not helping the people that need the help. Well, if what you're doing, doing with this bylaw is disincentivizing larger developments. You can have a builder come in and build seven houses at a cost of $800,000 a piece, $5.6 million, okay? You can have another builder come in and build eight houses for $600,000 each, $4.8 million. So by not building another unit or house, whatever you want to say, the, the builder that is spending 6.4 million on seven units, excuse me, 5.6 million on seven units doesn't have to put a nickel in the kitty. Whereas the guy that's putting up eight does. So it's my argument that this whole approach of using number of units is, is flawed and that we should be 
assessing a fee on the total cost of construction. I have a question for Ken. Um, if, if a builder is gonna build a required affordable unit, is there state data and prescriptions that tells them how many units? Like, oh, you know, our data shows your area really needs only three or two, you know, uh, one, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't think that that data, you know, the data that the state has and the one that is important to the communities is the subsidized housing inventory. So that's your, so that's the template, your the, yeah, so those are, you know, the state would, if you were to ask the state, you know, how many units they're going to say, well, you're over 10%. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know if there's, there's a number there that would be helpful to identify that need, um, because right now you're meeting the state, the state's requirement of 10%. Um, exceeding that um but it, you know obviously some may be sunsetting in the near future right. um and how do you address that um and then you know um those conversations um yeah i mean so i think with regards to this um this payment in lieu of we had that previous draft by law for the construction cost um and i don't recall um, you know, how, what ended up, I think there was something that Jim, you may have mentioned, um, town council had an issue with, I guess, one of the calculations. Um, and then this is another option for a payment in lieu of, which basically is the difference between your average mean price of housing um, and then the difference of what an affordable unit would be. Did anybody hear what I said? You're giving the developer an out. They don't have to build eight houses. They can build seven. And the value of those seven houses can be twice as much as building eight. And they don't have to put a nickel in. The, the, the problem with the, with the total value, Mike, is that could be all, that, that's going to be just as hard to put a dollar value to as what we're looking at right in front of us of the, of the value of the home. Well, except for the fact that if they build seven houses, they don't have to put anything into the kitty. And so I, I would, there's an, you're, giving them a, you're giving a developer an escape clause. So bear in mind also that not all developers operate on the same model. No. So some are doing the land preparation and selling building lots. Yeah, Others, look, look at Berkum hasn't put a penny into this, correct? And he doesn't have to. That's correct. He he, he got, was grandfathered. He's grandfathered. Um, then you have a a model like E Street Commons where Barry is building everything. Yeah. Then you have a model like Colony Estates where uh, that's off the one off Shattuck where the um, the owner is selling lots to yeah. people who will hire their own builder. Yeah. So I think we're spending a lot of time. Ken, how, how many times has the Shrewsbury formula kicked in and money has actually gone into the Assure Affordable Housing Trust? Um, I haven't gotten that information from them. I wasn't able. My guess is probably one or none. Okay. <sighs> Over 15 years? Yeah. Because there's outs. There's outs. We just found out what the, out, the outs are. You know, and I think we're spending a lot of time spinning our wheels here when the result is going to be minimal, if not nothing. But that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, that is part of the planning process. But we got to, we, you know, we can put, you know, I, I watched the, the uh, broadcast last week and Ken said, you know, put 40,000 or put 50,000, put whatever you want in. Well, is that planning? 
No, but it's kind of where where this thing has gone. <laughs> you know, we, we, we can adopt, adopt the Shrewsbury uh, formula and see what happens. Because I, I think you're going to find that it's not going to generate much at all into the insure, into the affordable housing trust. So, Ken, do you know if Shrewsbury has a planner? Is there? Yeah, or, that, they put me in touch with their affordable housing trust, um, of which I talked to their planner, um, and the planner is relatively new, so there has been tra some transitions. Because my question was, how many? Um, you know, how much has been? Uh, paid in lieu of the units being built. Um, I wasn't able to get an answer, um, but I, yeah. I, well, I we should look, we'll continue to look at the Shrewsbury uh, annual report. Wouldn't it have the numbers in there? Right, you'd have to go through 15 annual reports. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but you might be able to at least see how much money is in that affordable housing trust. True. My, my point is, well, you get my point. There's ways to get around this thing. And you might not, not again see a development such as the East Street Commons, where I happen to live, by the way, just because there's ways to get around any thing we put in, I think. So we're, we're, we're adopting the Shrewsbury model and we don't know if it's generated a nickel into the trust over there. That's, you know, we can do that. Because we spent so much time on this, we got to do something. <laughs> I don't think we're making a, a decision today. You know, I don't, I, I don't think it, it's going to matter how much more you debate this or what numbers to put in. I, I think the whole process has been uh, faulty. The more and more I think about it. Well, when when the board worked with um, Barry um, Roberts, those determinations were made on something, right? So the board or, or someone made the determinations that if he was an, unable to develop those properties on site, that he would pay into a fund. Um, was that based on any specific variable that we can either create a formula based on how those numbers, how the town arrived at those numbers, if the town thinks that that's enough, um, or, you know, continue to ensure that if we're going to be, if the town wants to look at this particular language that, you know, we worked on, um, and then I'll get, you know, some information from Shrewsbury, continue to well, do that. Colonial yeah. Estates up in North Hadley, uh, they put in seven houses, correct? Which one? Colonial Estates off of Shattuck. Colony, it's Colony. Uh, it's eight. 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 Eight, so it yeah. just just triggered the the uh, just triggered it. Just triggered it. Yeah, so he was supposed to have twelve, and he lost four lots to the spotted uh, eagle. So correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm, I'm digging really deep, but I think the pitch that Barry Roberts made was that um, it's going to cost me X number of dollars to build an affordable unit. Um, and the other units I am building sell for X plus Y, we'll call it. So for the six affordable units that I owe you, I will pay you the difference between X or I'll pay you Y, the difference between X plus Y, I'll pay you the Y. Um, 
the profit, I'll make the profit on selling market rate units, but I will give you the difference between what it would cost me to build it to affordable versus what I will get from it by building it to market. Does that strike people as the argument he made? Yes. Yeah, and the, the biggest problem, Bill, was remembering how do we keep track of it? And uh, it, it, it's difficult. Remember uh, the lawyers, the lawyer was really saying, you have to have an organization that will keep track of the affordability and and so that's why we what that's why we agreed to let him make a payment in lieu and support his application to the ZBA for a variance right. to do payment in lieu. Yep. It's not that easy because the the organizations that try to keep track of it, it's a like a perpetual fund. Uh, it's like a real estate fee of 7%, but they charge 10% or something like that. It, it was, uh, it was a yeah. difficult situation. Again, my opinion, this is not going to do anything to increase the supply of affordable housing. It's always, all it's going to do is impose more work on something, right? Trying to fill the numbers into the formula. If in that fact, we ever have to fill numbers into the formula. So what would you suggest? Should we uh, eliminate that affordable housing bylaw? No. I think it has. I think the trust has to be funded differently, and it has to be based on construction costs, including land, so people can't get around the eight units or whatever. Because you can put a you can put a development in of fifty units, and not a nickel goes into the fund. But you can do it. Have a development of eight, and the people you got to, and it's not structured. It's structured. Mike, I think. Uh, I mean, your argument is a it's a good financial one. But the reason we made the number uh, eight or ten is because what we did not want to do is uh, have people build twelve, fifteen units, and then we would eventually get below the ten percent threshold. So that's why that number was put in place. Well, I think if we had, I sound like a socialist here, but you know, uh, if we had a, the easiest thing to do would be put, to impose a cost tax on construction. And so everybody puts into the kitty. You're gonna come into town, you're gonna build a $2 million home someplace and you don't have to put anything into the affordable housing trust. Come on. Well, this, that's the state. The state's problem, and they're doing that now. You're being taxed, Mike. Aren't there going to be developers that want to develop more than five or six acres, which would limit them to the seven or eight? Yeah. Um, just a I second, think point, what, everybody. I think Hold by on. having this Stop. type of thing in place, you're dissuading them from to, from developing. Okay. Just to be clear, everybody somewhere, somewhere, somebody got the idea of seven and eight units. The, the inclusionary bylaw specifically says six, six or six or more mm -hmm. requires. So the developers can only develop, can only build up to five units and get away with not putting anything into the fund. Right. You know, why is an ideal unit? Movers being you putting something in. That's a major development in town. That's it's not, not residential. It's not residential. Well, the, you, but, but so, are, so what? I'm they question, are going to be putting something in under the transfer of development rights, though. Yeah, okay, you got that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just think we're spinning our wheels here on something that uh, is not going to result in much of anything coming to the trust fund. We got to vote on something. Uh, I'm, I'm, on that's that, that's my argument. In some ways, I'm the devil's advocate, but, but it's just I'm, becoming clear to me that uh, that's why I'd like to know how much how much how much money in Shrewsbury has gone into the trust fund over the last five years. So <laughs> I'm I'm I just found their housing production plan. It's in their housing production plan with regards to their payment in lieu of units. 
Since the adoption of the bylaw in 2005, the town has generated $472,020.76. And that's a town of how many people? Um, I think there's about 40,000. No. Probably 15, 20,000. How much was that? No, it's 37. They have about 38,000 people. So um, 38,000 people has over the last, since when? 2005. Or six. So, so over the last 15 years, they've got $400,000 into the trust? 400, 472,000, yeah. I rest my case. Well, housing has not exactly been booming anywhere in the state either. Well, but maybe they're actually building their units instead of doing the in lieu of. I don't know if, if we know that. Yeah, good point. So, I mean, I kind of like going back to the formula. Land plus, plus building plus mortgage equals a number. Subtract away the uh, affordability factor, and that's what they should be donating, putting into the fund. But or give them a, or, or give them a flat fee to put in, and if they can prove based on that formula that would be less, then the planning board could be could take a look at it. It and you know it's it's difficult to compare if if you know where Shrewsbury is, it's right across Lake Quinsigamon from Worcester, and Worcester is building tons of affordable housing, so. It's uh, it's the difference between a little bit more affluent community in a city that has uh, thousands of units. So maybe so, that's their maybe that's their way of getting rid of their guilt. I don't know. So tucked in later in the plan, they are expecting some additional funds because it talks about future development. So this was the plan that was adopted in 2019. Um, and so there's an additional four, 461,000 pending about. And does that say anything about where they stand in terms of the 10%? Good question. I can, I can find that. that because maybe they've been trying to encourage billing them to avoid hostile uh, 40 Bs. Maybe we could do a Friendly, what is it, 40B in town? A friendly 40B? Yeah. We tried that once and we got it tucked to us. Big really? time. Mountain View Apartments. Jim, were you on then? Yep. I remember that one. Arthur Prechet presenting. Yeah. Somehow that doesn't quite look like what he told us. Exactly right. Exactly right. Oh, so I, I, I'm just actually thinking about it from, from Mike's perspective. Maybe, maybe having a trigger point, the, the safe harbor below, was it? Five, five or fewer units in the safe harbor, um, six or more, you have to jump into the affordable pool. Um, maybe, I, I don't know if there is a structure that would support this, but is there something we could assess at the subdivision approval level for an assessment uh, based on the number of lots? I think that would not allow anyone to escape. <laughs> well, true. Unless, um, because I just, you understand my drift. I was trying to be the devil's advocate here. Frankly, I didn't know where my argument was going, but I found out pretty damn quickly. Well, <laughs> um, but there, there's something, there's something not unfair about if you, if you want to do approval, not required lots, use up all the frontage you have. If you want a subdivision 
everybody has to play. I, I don't know if there is a, I don't know if there is a way to monetize that. There should be. That's the same boat we're in, Bill. All we do is lower our threshold to any subdivision as opposed to six lots. Then we could go to something like, because it's being spread across everything, we could go to more of a flat figure that uh, you know, the one condition of subdivision approval is a payment of $20,000 per building lot per subdivision to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Would you but live, you know, but, or maybe you do something like a range. Zero through three lots is, say, 20000 a lot. Um, three through six lots is another number. And above six lots, it's this number. We call that the Lehman formula on Wall Street. You know what happened to Lehman Brothers. <laughs> but once once again uh we're at just below 13 percent most communities are are below that amherst and northampton but the fact remains is that we're anticipating us going below the 10 percent. that was the reason we did all of this so we would not fall below 10 percent Correct. Uh, I think maybe we should have a trigger. If all of a sudden we reach 11%, then we should initiate this. But why should we Too late. really build it up and really not have this club sticking over our head? Because we know for a fact in the next 10 years, we're going to be below 10%. Unless not, something not, is done. Not really. Not really, because... Uh, we could negotiate these people to extend the contract. Well, Mountain View, they, the Mountain View is coming off in, I'm not sure what it is, in, in about five or six years, Mountain View comes off of the list. But they extended it for three more years because the town repaired their water leak. That, that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's got about five or six years that are coming off of the list. Yeah. So, uh, and, and that's going to bring us down a little bit. But when whatever they're called now with the senior housing over there, where they've got a bunch of affordability, there is about, I don't know, what is, what is 10 or 15 years, 12 years left over there. That's going to bring us, that's going to bring us down. So we're trying to not, we're, we're trying to not be reactionary here. We want to be proactive and do what we can to keep the stuff. That's, that's the reason we put it in, but, uh, that was 10 years ago. So uh, well, I, I think I don't know, I, I'm saying the wolf is not at our door. So we don't have to make a decision this year or. Well, that's, but, that's, that's true, but we don't want to have this conversation going on so that Mike gets so discouraged that he leaves us in anger. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, well, I, I, well, you know, it only, it only happened if I go off my meds. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but but we, we, you're right, Joe. We don't need to do it tonight, but we we don't want to drag this out like Bill no, said. It's going on for so long. I mean, we can always amend this, but you know, let me just ask you: What if a developer came into town and said, uh, "I want to take over one of these hotels on Route Nine, and I want to turn it into low and moderate housing." Low, moderate income housing, SROs, single SRO. room. Well, not necessarily single single room occupancy, but one bedrooms and two bedrooms. Could we incentivize that? Excuse me. Could we incentivize that? Well, that, that yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. Depending, I mean, that, that's that's a the, depending on the plan month. Let's see what they would propose. Yeah, I've, I've heard. I've heard. A, I'd call it more than a rumor, but uh, it's something for the board to start thinking about because clearly the nature of Halley's changing, Route 9's changing, the hotels are along Route 9, there's public transportation, which are important to lower moderate income housing. Uh, and so just so, something to well, think about. 
we've, we've actually learned a lot in the process. So one thing sure. that we would say, if we're going to play, let's make a deal. Uh, you want uh, you, you want to put residential property, residential dwelling units in the industrial zone where they are not prohibited, where they are presently prohibited. Yeah. Um, okay. We'll let's talk about that. Sure. Will you give us a perpetual affordability restriction? A yeah, permanent right. one. Yeah. And then maybe we would uh, consider supporting a zoning change. Okay. Well, I think we could. So that, that is part of it. If we, if we can get involved with the conversation, Yes. You know, when when that compre- when Winfield came in on a comprehensive permit, that was driven by the developer's desire to build something and the financing tools that they had available to them, which yeah. required it to be don't didn't require it to be affordable for more than what twenty years, twenty five years maybe. Um, if we can really do some negotiations and get that perpetual affordability that's a different story and that solves that goes to your concern joe that you know we'll we're not going to fall off the cliff if we have some perpetual affordability there take us into the next century some of the units at winfield or whatever they're called now are perpetual and some are not so i I like bill's idea about changing the sub if you put a subdivision in you put some money into a pot based on you know, one to three or one to five, whatever it may be. And then above six, it's a different value, maybe. I think it would certainly simplify things and take this in a different direction. Direction, And I'm not sure if you're going to disincentivize people from developing in Hadley, but we certainly know that if you develop in Hadley, you're going to be put, putting something into the trust. As we've got it structured right now, we have no guarantee that if you have development in Hadley, a substantial development, that you're going to get anything into the trust. Right. So, Ken, have you heard of anything like that? I've been trying to do a Google search. Um, That's (laughs) that's interesting. Um, It's actually very fascinating um, that that has come up. So the requirement would be that if you are submitting your subdivision plans, that for every unit, there is just an automatic cost, like a $20,000 per unit, if you have a certain amount to go into the affordable housing trust fund. Yeah. Yeah. That really simplifies things. Uh, But it does raise the cost of housing for everybody else. Uh, The cost of housing is... There's no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah. Let everybody subsidize. No matter what we do, Bill, I mean, Joe, this is raising the cost of housing. Yeah. Okay. You're right. We're in an unusual situation here because we have space and land that uh, we're we're vulnerable. I agree. But we're also uh, the... uh, the elephant in the room is the University of Massachusetts has abdicated the responsibility for housing all the students. Okay. So we yeah. have students uh, where ordinarily a family of two, two kids and a couple. Now you've got five students in there that can bring a lot more rent or six students in there or maybe 10. Uh, how many, but they can bring a lot more rent in for the, that particular unit of housing. So the affordability is is gone so the whole thing about hotels along route nine you know the economics that they put down on paper three years ago are not the economics that you're seeing now uh and so there might be some room for some liquidations or sales to somebody just to get out of some of this debt uh but that's just a a side comment but uh, I, i think excuse me go go ahead I thought you were done. No, no. That, that, I just saying the economics of the hotel business have changed dramatically. And they might be better use for those properties, including affordable housing along Route 9. Well, I thought about that when, after you suggested it. 
five or so minutes ago, and the incentive is the incentive would I don't know there would be enough to cover their cost to transform those from what the code sees as transient lodging to turn them into somewhere where you can cook and have you know a stove and you know full refrigerator and what that yeah. means code wise maybe they could have a common kitchen <laughs> no um, like uh, apple uh, apple and and going to joe's point about the university uh, i don't know the particulars but i think that they're working on a, some pretty big deal this new p3 thing that they've been talking about the public private partnership that they're trying to get someone to build a boatload of units so yeah but you know some of the hotels there are like two or three stories and so we solved the land problem I don't know. See if we can wrap it up some way, Ken. I mean, Ken has been patiently listening and he's done a lot well, of research for us. Uh, uh, I mean, we're spinning our is, wheels. Is it, the, is it the sense of the board then we go with an assessment per subdivision? Lot? I, I, I think we need to look in, as opposed yeah. to saying we want to do that, I think it's a good idea and we need to look into what, what the numbers would be and at what the splits would be on a number of subdivision lots. Uh -huh. Am I correct in thinking that when we initially set this up, we have to go to town meeting and if we tweaked it later, we don't? Is no. that right or no? No, if, if, we, if we change the number of lots to something under six, we need to go back to town meeting. Or if we change the equation, how we calculate the, the, the equation we can do in a general bylaw. We're free to do that in our regulations. Okay. However, the over six lots in a subdivision donating and five or less not donating is a zone bylaw. Okay. So if we I'd, change I'd, that, we, we need to go back to town meeting. I'd be curious, um, and, you know, as I will look at subdivision regulations that may include this amount of money that would be submitted to the housing trust fund. And what that would do to affordable housing being developed on site. Um, you know, would that, would the requirement be that they're going to spend $20,000 per lot and then on top of that be required to, if they're over a certain amount, six, to also build the affordable unit on site? Yeah. I think my thinking is right. Um, or that would, would be double dipping, wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? Well, or, or you could do it if you build one through five lots, you donate 20,000 per lot, just as a number. Mm -hmm. If you build six or more, you donate according to whatever formula we come up with to the Affordable Housing Trust. And there is room in there possibly for relieve relieving the developer of making the payments if they provide an affordable unit in on the premises absolutely yeah the, the, the donation is a, is, is a voluntary is, thing if they provide on site how about if he builds it off site or off site yeah off site yeah any place in the town of hadley all right you know we, we were kind of using uh, shrewsbury as a Prototype here. I'd be curious. You've been using Shrewsbury, not us. Yeah, yeah. You've been using Shrewsbury, not the rest of us. <laughs> Ken brought it up, not me. Well, you keep harping on it. Well, he, he brought it up. It's the Shrewsbury <laughs> model. I'd like I'd be curious to see whether or not uh, yeah. any developments have taken place in Shrewsbury under the current bylaw that includes an affordable unit in developments. I, I mean, I that I think that the the town planner can help me with that number with regards to how the inclusionary bylaw has worked for the town with with affordable units built on site or affordable homes built on site. Um, I know there's a little more density over there, so um, you know they we have get some, some density here too. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I think that that could be insightful. 
Um, but Shrewsbury, Ken, as you know, you've got the hospital close by yes. and you've got MBI, Massachusetts Biomedical Institute, that hundred acres of the state hospital is, is booming in the nice residential area is right across Lake Quinsigamon. And mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't sound like a place that's going to have a lot of affordable units because they're expensive homes. Yeah. Well, okay, those are my editorial well, comments. I'll keep We that. have to find a way to make units affordable. And this is not, our approach maybe is not accomplishing that. Uh, we're, this is not an easy bylaw. We know that. We never expected it to be easy when we started. And we're going to uh, go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. So, <laughs> so no, we choose to. Yes. So, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong. Currently, we say you have to make a payment in lieu, but without a calculation that we provide, that's a negotiation that we do, like we did with Barry, right? And so, what we're trying to do is set a formula that takes it off the negotiating table. Basically, yes. Yeah. I mean, we're we're, we're trying to set something that's not so much a negotiating point, but a, you know, the negotiation should be, well, you know, I can build it for a hundred dollars a square foot. Well, prove it kind of a deal. Okay. Right. We think it should be closer to 250. So if you can build it for a for hundred, show us your numbers. Mark Dunn may be onto something. The fact is mm -hmm. we're trying to set something up as a guidance, like you were saying, Jim, but we shouldn't put it in stone because obviously the economy is going to be changing. The building costs are going to be changing. Maybe we should negotiate it at the time, just set the number of units that are going to be involved, but the negotiation can be put off. But, but what is that what we really want to do? Or do we want to make specific guidelines to say, this is what the cost is, bingo. I think we want to have specific guidelines, but with wiggle room to what, uh, okay, I, I part, of what part of the process I see here is that we are using our accumulated expertise in this area, mm -hmm. not necessarily to straight jacket the next generation, but to give them some guidance so they don't have to go through all of this again. Good point. You know, 10 years from now. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. That we don't want to give them such hard numbers that it's 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 set too much in stone. It's going to be enough, like Bill said, wiggle room to make it reasonable today and in the future. The good thing is, I mean, this is going to be a regulation, so it's not. It doesn't take the town meeting to to change it. Wiggle room, but not arbitrary and capricious. Yeah. We're, we're, think of this, Mark, as we're writing our memoirs. Yeah. <laughs> or we're tying our noose. I'm not sure what. We want to continue this to uh, October 19th. Oh, that might be a bloodbath. We want to get Kevin on that. Now we can always do it after Kevin, depending what we found out. Yeah, we, we could continue it just for two weeks. The, all we have next week is our next meeting is the public hearing on the fall town meeting zoning. Oh, okay. Mike's not going to be here though at that one. No, I could play devil's advocate for him. Thank you. Okay, well, I've tried to train. I've tried to train you. It's been tough, but <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that gets into the miss more than one meeting rule, but I think that you can, so we didn't really open the hearing for tonight. That's right. We've never, oh, we're only talking about Ken's formula, but you did miss a prior meeting. Um, I, got that, I got that sign. I told you. Yeah. But if you're going to, if we schedule it for two weeks from now and you miss that, then you would not be able to vote, but you could still have an opinion. Okay. But, well, but the other thing is, if we don't open the inclusionary zone, but we just talk about the idea, we're not opening the hearing again. Okay. 
We can just uh, talk about the formulas that we're talking about tonight and different ideas. And, and, not, re- and not make any decision. Okay, so I'm, I'm excited to share this, this bylaw with you that I just stumbled across from Barnstable. Um, but it, it's really interesting. It, 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 it addresses the paying into the fund for each lot that's created. Um, through subdivision approval. Um, so anyway, I'm going to share that with you after this meeting. Okay, great. Thank you, Ken. Um, okay, so... Maybe we should, that, that whole idea of uh, affordable housing in the industrial zone, maybe we could, you, you guys could think some more about that. Okay, so we'll continue the discussion to October 5th. Right. We'll continue the public hearing to either the 7th, the 19th, or... November 2nd. November 2nd. We may be too warm, depending on... But we can always continue. If we continue it to the 19th, we can always just move it again. Okay. Yeah. Because everybody will be. Let's just do that. Yeah, okay, I'll make a motion to continue the public hearing to October 19th. Okay. I'll second. Good job, Ken Sherlock Comia. Okay, we got a motion and a second uh, yes. to continue the hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Good. Ken's opposed. So. Um, uh, I, I see that Tom is here. Tom, are you paying you attention? Anything? You might have fallen asleep on us. Oh, no, yeah. I'm here. How you doing? Right, so Hampshire Mall did not come in tonight. Okay. Uh, so I'll get on her because I, I, you know, they should have removed at least one of those signs uh, for the entrance there. So. So there's one other thing that Tom and I were discussing. I sort of gave him a green light, but since he's here, the um, that mural they put up at uh, L.L. Bean. That a rip. The oh, framework rip. behind it is rotten, and it has to come down. Uh, Already? It's got a rip in it, too. It's probably why the water got in on the wood behind yep. it. Right. Uh, they want to repaint it. And my recollection of the site plan approval was they originally came in with a design that we approved. And then they came back and said, can we put that mural up? So uh, I said uh, to Tom, because it was sort of between meetings, that as long as the color they were proposing to repaint the wall with was the color that had been approved in, when we did site plan approval, they wouldn't have to come back and see us. As I recall, they originally proposed basically the wall would look like their credit card. So it was like branding. And Mike said, what about if you did our local area? And so then they had an artist turn it into the Holyoke Range. Is, is that not right? I don't so then, recall. So then, it it wasn't, so then it wasn't so much branding. The original, that was when they were talking about putting up a decal or whatever that thing yeah. is. The, yeah. the original design, as I remember, was just it was just painted. Uh, a color. Then, then they wanted to come back and refurbish it. Mm. Or they wanted to up the game. But I think uh, they provided Tom with the color. It was just a an off-white or brownish tone of some sort. Yeah, it's, it's very neutral. It's it's um, So I do have that in an email, the color and all. <clears throat> when they came back to to do something different, that was when we approved the uh, the mural, which I guess is you know printed on something and then hung up there. But that phase that you're remembering was the was the second level. The first level was just a painted wall, and I that's concur- what we approved originally. Yeah, I concur with what Bill says. If it's going to be a neutral color, you know, they don't have to come back to us. But if they're going to put something else, well, then they'll have to come back. Let's see. There you go. 
kind of like what we said to Planet Fitness. You know, if it's your branding, <clears throat> then that that impacts the signage. But if it's a neutral color that ties into the rest of the complex. That's right, Mark. I was in there last night, actually, and the sales guy said that they wanted to repaint it because it was peeling. So he didn't say anything about changing it. But... Uh, I do not have anything else. Who was the first person who came in tonight, Bill? Uh, James Channing. Jim Channing. Pride. He's the general counsel for Pride. Okay, yeah, that's right. That was the A and R. Okay, he, yeah, they, they're in-house attorney. Okay. All right, I have nothing else. Anybody have anything? No, I I got to ask Bill. Uh, what time do you want me to sign that lot? Uh, um, pick a time and uh, if you want to, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a call. I, I don't know what tomorrow is going to be like. I don't need it for tomorrow, so I'll, I just oh, okay. need to right. connect with you sometime to get it done. That's fine. I'm around. Okay. okay. Hearing none. Motion to thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Yeah. Mo motion I'll, to I'll adjourn. Think, <laughs> so moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Bye. 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 Well, meeting is history. Thank you. And thank you, Ken. And thank you, John.